Hi friends, I'm Maria Beliora and I welcome you to my channel. Today is the second part of my confessional about how I completely broke down and I don't want to say stopped but cheated on my Nova year. In the previous part we talked about like a huge variety, all variety of niche and hyperlux, like very expensive, very rare, very sort of exclusive type of perfumes that I managed to score, hunt down through various online resources. So this particular part is a, a incredibly special to me because I've heard about this brand a lot of legends basically there is so much that is said about it that it's hard to even figure out what's true and what's not i'm talking about mona de oreo brand uh fairly recently like within the last five years they changed i think they changed hands and they changed the packaging some people say for the better some people say for the worst but the whole legend of Mona Deoria, and I highly recommend that you read up, read up about her. She's basically the kind of like <laughs> Iron Rand of perfumery. She uh, was a, a student of Edmund Rudnitska, a truly very influential and like a ma master of the like in, in the world of perfumery and she was very early pronounced to be kind of like a prodigy. Mona was uh, rumored to have an incredible stylistic sense of balance. A lot of her perfumes have rather simple names. Vanille, Amber, Musk. And you think how difficult it is to create a vanilla scent. The name of them is Legion. Um, however, Again, according to, maybe at this point it's a marketing ploy, but I believe a large degree of legendarism around Mona de Oreo because people who truly love perfumes, people who've spent all their life doing per, per, uh, fragrance uh, olfactory journalism, people who worked in the industry, almost all of them have some Mona de Oreo bottles in their collections and their libraries, at least for the reference sake. Very hard to find, very expensive, and especially poignant now because she died fairly young. It seems like her perfumes are now becoming um, sort of the, the the Van Gogh story in the perfumery. So her dying made them even more valuable when she is you know gone rather than when she was alive. It seems that there was not much marketing around them, and only the people in the very specific circle um, really knew about them and their value. So it was a very much kind of like elite kind of brand maybe not in the spirit by, by, by the nature of the production, how the whole business plan organized. Now anyone can buy Mona de Oreo perfumes. They are still very expensive, but they are not more expensive than Tom Ford's or Killian's to that matter. So I was very curious, given the, the legendary and the cult status of some of her compositions that are thought or at least rumored to be like the golden standard, the golden ratio of how you wrap a note. And that was her unique artistic take on how you represent vanilla, how do you represent amber, how you properly embellish and surround and complement any particular heart note. I was lucky enough that I managed to buy a, a travel size uh, rose perfume, the I think it's whole something about Holland, Holland roses, um, and I fell in love with it. It's the most unusual rose perfume that I tried. It's again, it has and it also has all of the qualities that you expect from very very exquisite blend. It has longevity. It changes with time. It opens up. It mutates. It morphs, and yet it's very bright but it's not sickly or overpowering so this is truly something that you can study like a, a painting in a way so that just got me in a desperate state of mind trying to score some mono de Oreo somewhere for a price that i could kind of live with <laughs> and i was lucky enough that i first found one i must say i found them 
around roughly like a hundred dollar mark. Uh, they were not super cheap, uh, but it's better than two or three hundred dollars, I guess. And the second one in my collection that I want to show you that I just just acquired, again, all of them are secondhand, is Vetiver. Uh, my belief that I can become friends with Vetiver, Vetiver was restored uh, by Prada Cologne, which is, you know, Infusions de Prada Vetiver. But this is a very light, slightly powdery, kind of like dry, light form um, take on Vetiver. I also have Vetiver, Vetiver by Serge Lutens. And again, if you're interested in me making sort of a review or like ranking of all of my Vetiver fragrances, please let me know in the comments below. But here we're talking about Mono Dior's Vetiver. So this is it. My, all of mine are coming in the new packaging. I think to get the first editions, the old packaging, which, oh, and sure enough, sure enough, I go for the, hopefully nothing breaks. Yeah, because the, the lids are very heavy. Um, I was afraid that I would break it. Uh, the first editions are, can easily cost $500 because they're just very, very precious. They're very hard to find. So unfortunately, I don't know what happened here, but the name Vetiver kind of started sliding on my bottle. And I feel that all of the bottles that I got at first I thought it was like, oh, is it a fake? But then by the power and the complexity of these fragrances, it just, if it, is, if it is a fake, then it's very expensive one because these fragrances have something genre sais quoi. They have something special about the power coupled to longevity, coupled to amorphness. The perfume bottles are very heavy, but I feel like they all have all of the ones I'm gonna show you today have the flaw that the name of the perfume is not very securely um, say glued or like attached to the glass surface and eventually starts sliding, especially if you get remnants of the perfume oils on the bottle, then it kind of like somehow dissolves the, the name. Even for a hot second, I was scared that I bought a fake, but the perfume is so complex, strong, and has such a typical, kind of like comparable transitional power as my Holland Roses that I very quickly decided, no, the, if, if it is a fake, it's the most expensive fake <laughs> on the planet because to make such a perfume would really not be easy. So, Vetiver by Mona Di Oreo. I just got it, right? Like, I just got all of this. So I'm not really ready to give you a full rundown. And if you're interested in comparative vetiver analysis, we can do it in a different video. But this is a gourmand vetiver. The way that Mona went about it, about embellishing a vetiver note, that she added a lot of this soft, kind of sweet musk, you know, like gourmandy musky notes around the vetiver. It's beautiful. This is the kind of vetiver that I'd love, I would love to wear, especially in the evening time. It's an incredible take on substantial su sweet-ish vetiver. The second one that I got is Amber. I'm a big fan of Amber. And to be honest, because of that, I'm rather skeptical. Uh, a lot of amber-centric fragrances smell very, very similar. And as much as I love the note, eventually enough is enough. You know, like it's like, okay, like how much can you really surprise me with a fragrance that, okay, how do I open it without dropping it? Okay, here we go. So here is amber. As you can see, same kind of bottle. And there's just like a, a the logo of Mono Di Oreo and a short name. One of the things that I don't like about many amber fragrances that to me they start sm smelling like jam, like apricot jam. And I was really kind of cautious that this would not smell similar to Black Pearls by Elizabeth Taylor, like that, that's the cheap kind of ambery scents that I can't stand. The same would be good, we could go for Chapar Casimir, 
in the other ones. So yeah, I'm very picky about my embers. This is a very resinous amber. It's obviously sweet, as all amber scents are, but it's not sticky sweet. So the resins and some of the spices are taking the kind of like sharpening the scent and making it way more austere even. I would never expect the kind of the amber to be shaped by the opposites because usually you know what people add to amber is some floral or some a little bit of soft sweet creamy resinous notes something you know just to make sweet even sweeter round even rounder uh charming even charmier <laughs> uh, but here the amber is actually wrapped in notes that are i dare say a little bit severe they're they're more austere they are more sharp and strong and yet it's undoubtedly an amber centric fragrance oh this is gonna be such an interesting test drive i'm so excited to start wearing these and like l kind of living into these perfumes and the third one my prized possession that i want to show you again just got these I obviously really want vanilla too, but I couldn't find it. This is musk. And also, you know, eventually I had to stop somewhere because I was just blowing my whole budget. Uh, all right, Mona Di Oreo musk. Many people who have way more money than me and way wider and more exquisite collections than me claim that musk is the top one. If they had to rank all of the Mona Diori fragrances, Musk will be like at least in the top three. It's usually somewhere between, uh, I think, Amber and Musk. So there are there are thousands of Musks. If you, somebody tells you that such and such perfume is musky, it tells you almost nothing, because Musks can be dry and almost bitter. Musks can be very sweaty and like body odor like. Musks can be very very ozonic and almost laundry like. You know, the, the smell of fresh laundry. M musks can be, there's like a thousand faces of musks. So this musk, this musk, at least on the surface of it, is spicy. This is a sweet musk, gourmand musk. But I'm kind of like surprised how spicy it is. Again, I wouldn't expect, musk is a typical animalic note that is probably in every top five sexy perfumes. Any, any sexy perfume list you, you witness, there will be musk in the top five. Therefore, to wrap musk, with such prickly spices as a bit of a like it gives me a pause some part of me wants to compare it with Masque Vajur by Frederick Mal Mal but I, I think that is a different kind of musk but I would say if I had to find a distant relative at least like a family of musks to give you a reference point kind of like this kind of sweet, spicy musk. I think Frederic Malle, Musk Ravageur, and Musk by Mona Diorio uh, could be living on the same continent, at least. <sighs> Not summer-friendly perfumes, all of these three, I must say, <laughs> which just kind of makes it a bit of a uh, odd predicament for me to test drive them in Florida <laughs> in summer but I'll do my best. If you guys are interested in me talking about sort of the my top acts or ranking my list of musks, ambers, or vetivers, featuring Mona Diorio fragrances and trying to give you sort of a reference point, please, please let me know. I have like a really huge list of requests and videos that I want to make. I just really wanna make something that is of 
essential interest right now to you and me so you know like it's also the question of time i will eventually like make videos about all of your requests but i just want to know what do you think is most timely for now and the last perfume that i'm going to show you kind of like again the reference to a perfume house the niche perfume house that i love and I want to be on their PR list. I want my I, I want a whole library shelf with their perfumes. This is Histoire de Parfums. They make they make perfumes that are shaped like books. For God's sake, love love everything about the concepts, how they blend the perfumes, how they package the perfumes. This is like a prime example. Even their travel versions, I pack a packaged gift worthy like. Uh, they all have original packaging. They all have an interesting bottle design. They're not just this typical kind of like cylindrical bottles. So the one that I finished a sample off and I just lost sleep over it. And when I just went off the rails with my purchasing habits, I, I immediately got it. This is Matahari by Histoire de Parfums and the, the year to each it is dedicated is 1876. Just so you know, these are not some random numbers. These are all historical events. Again, the Histoire de Parfums is the history of perfumery. They like to take any kind of historical figure, event, place, a year, and create an olfactory story around it. So Matahari, an infamous uh, courtesan, also spy, how does she smell? Let's see. What does Histoire de Parfum say about this perfume? As captivating a trail of scent as Mother Hari, born 1876, hence so the, basically her birth year, the name of the perfume, was the Javanese princess. Although born in the Netherlands, a femme fatale courtesan and spy who captured the hearts of men and followed her own destiny to the hilt. Oh, bitter, boozy herbs with these kind of very intoxicating bitter, it's like intoxicating bitter flowers. This is a perfume that has zero sweetness, zero gourmand. This is for those of you who like Love Blue by uh, Guerlain, maybe Mitsuka by Guerlain, for some reason they often are compared, though I see them as very different. Anyway, if you like any of those like dark, powdery, herbal, um, with additions of kind of herbal liquor or gin, these kind of perfumes that are balancing between classic shipper and cologne go but to go into more animalic musky or sometimes powdery side this all i feel in matahari i feel some kind of animalic sensual muskiness that is lurking behind those kind of like bitter poisonous herbs it's like it's like a cocktail of things and yet at the dry down it becomes demure and powdery but this is the kind of perfume if you like the concept of uh, bitter herbals this is for you if you like Lair blue if you like classic shippers Matahari 1876 by Histoire de Parfums, you'll like it. This is the cheapest one I found. I hope that 15 mil will sustain me for a while, but I'm not gonna lie. If it was up to me, I would have a whole bookshelf full of these perfumes. All right, I think I'm gonna stop here. There are way more perfumes that I want to show you. If you're curious about the olfactory libraries, if you want to make sense of all of these um, diverse combinations of affordable, designer, luxury, hyperlux, niche uh, fragrances, please subscribe to my channel. There's way more coming in the, in the very nearest future. Thank you so very much for watching. Please let me know if you tried any of these or if there are any kind of like very exquisite, very, very coveted 
brands that you just can't quite commit to you know spend your money buying but you like adore them and you really really wish you could add more perfumes of theirs onto your shelf please let me know i'm super curious for me you can see mono Dior was some kind of like just an open wound i i, I had to try it for myself i i had to figure out what what's that legend all is all about and histoire de parfums is just a a favorite of mine. I have very soft spot for them, same as I have for L'Artisan Parfumeur. If you like what you see, please subscribe to my channel so you don't miss the next part and I'll see you there! <laughs>